dear colleagues, I uh, uh, declare open uh, the plenary sitting of the 2020 annual session of the NATO Parliamentary uh, Assembly. Uh, welcome to all of you and a special word of welcome to NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg, who will join me on screen in a moment. Uh, the key theme for our sitting today will be how NATO adapts to remain a political, military, transatlantic alliance, unsurpassed today and in the future. One year ago, at their December meeting in London, Allied leaders decided to launch a reflection process on ways to strengthen NATO, NATO further. Of course, uh, they did not know then that this uh, process would coincide with the most serious, profound and wide-ranging crisis which our societies and economies have known in decades. COVID-19 has taught us important lessons about our ability to sustain major global shocks as societies and as an international community. This pandemic has also confirmed that our nations must learn to better confront a number of new dynamics and new challenges. Among these are the rise of China and our dependence on Beijing in strategic sectors and the need to better counter disinformation and propaganda. For all these reasons, COVID-19 is a security issue. But of course, the security challenges which predated the pandemic have not disappeared. To the contrary, first among these are Russia's aggressive actions, terrorism, instability in our neighborhood, hybrid and cyber threats, and emerging and disruptive technologies. NATO 2030 offers a timely and important opportunity to ensure NATO is prepared to deal with these challenges and any further ones, and to learn the lesson from the COVID-19 pandemic. A key pillar of this alliance is remarkable commitment to collective defense, NATO's defining principle, uh, principle enshrined in the Article 5. Allies must continue to demonstrate this commitment in words and in deeds. In this, the alliance should not overreach, but it must address the entire range of complex and diverse threats at the 360 degrees. To back up this commitment, we must continue to maintain defense spending and investment in innovation and technology, despite the increased pressure on public budgets in the wake of the pandemic. But we must also work harder to achieve a fair sharing of the burdens and responsibilities for defense. This is essential for NATO's ability to address today's complex threat environment. But it is also essential for transatlantic unity and solidarity. The bond uniting Europe and North America is unique. It is the wellspring of NATO's unmatched political and military strengths, and we cannot let it weaken. Similarly, our values must remain our compass. We must protect them and resolutely counter those who seek to undermine the democratic foundations of our societies and institutions. We must also do more to protect rules-based international order, working with like-minded partners from Europe to Asia. This order is threatened by many factors. Russia, of course, and its many ongoing violations of international law, but also China, and its attempt to impose its own vision and values. Let me be clear. China must act as a responsible global player. We can no longer afford to be naive about its ambitions and role. Recommitting NATO to shared values is also a prerequisite for strengthening the political dimension within NATO. Allies must consult more and better. This will increase predictability among alliance, foster a better understanding of allies' national interests and policies, and promote a greater convergence of interests and strategic priorities. Allies must also make decisions faster and streamline their decision-making processes while preserving the fundamental principle of consensus. 
The diversity of today's threats and the multipolar world make it more difficult for many citizens to understand NATO's mission and contribution to security. Yet, public support is an indispensable element of NATO's strengths and credibility. We must strengthen communication and public diplomacy to explain how NATO delivers security for citizens. And we must back it up with necessary resources. Our assembly is particularly well-placed to support key elements of this vision, whether, whether it is about enhanced political consultation, uh, rededicating ourselves to our shared values, maintaining public support, Uh, sorry, now it's okay, sorry. Uh, maintaining public uh, uh, support for NATO, keeping up efforts on defense spending and innovation, or broadening NATO's network of partners. We complement and amplify NATO's action in ways no other organization can. Therefore, I want to thank NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg for recognizing our assembly as a key stakeholder in the NATO 2030 and reiterate our commitment to support this process as best we can. Later this afternoon, I will present a draft declaration which includes a number of recommendations on NATO 2030. This text draws much of its inspiration from the cont contributions which assembly delegations have submitted over the summer and early autumn. I therefore sincerely hope you will be able to support it. But let me stop here for now and uh, for formally welcome uh, Mr. Jens Stoltenberg, Secretary General of NATO and Chairman of the North Atlantic Council. Uh, Jens, please uh, uh, join me on, on screen. Uh, Mr. Stoltenberg, uh, thank you for attending this first ever online session of NATO Parliamentary Assembly. And now I would like to give the floor to you, please, Mr. General Secretary. Thank you so much, uh, President uh, Mr. Hasi, uh, Attila, and thank you for your leadership of uh, the NATO Parliamentary Assembly in this uh, very difficult uh, period. I have really enjoyed working with you, and I appreciate also the many phone calls we have had during your tenure as, uh, as the President of the NATO Parliamentary uh, Assembly. Honourable members, dear friends and colleagues, it is a pleasure to be with you all again. I last addressed your annual session a year ago in London. Since then, COVID-19 has changed our lives in ways we could barely have imagined. None of the countries and communities you represent have been left untouched. NATO allies and our military, militaries have been supporting each other, uh, our partners, throughout this pandemic. Transporting critical medical supplies, patients and experts setting up military field hospitals and securing borders, supporting civilian efforts and helping to save lives. As you now face the next wave, NATO has established a stockpile of medical supplies in Italy. It's uh, already being used to provide for allies in need. Just in the last uh, few weeks, we have distributed hundreds of extra ventilators to our allies in Albania, the Czech Republic, Montenegro and North Macedonia. And we are ready to provide further assistance. At the same time, we remain vigilant and ready. Because NATO's main responsibility is to make sure this health crisis does not become a security crisis. Our military readiness has been upheld. And our missions and operations continue. From our battle groups in the east of the Alliance to Kosovo, Afghanistan and Iraq. This is NATO adaptation at its best. And this is what I want to talk to you about today. How NATO can continue to evolve in the face of an ever more uncertain world. Last December NATO leaders asked me to lead a forward-looking reflection to future-proof our alliance. And that is why I launched NATO 2030, to make our strong alliance even stronger and fit to face any challenge in the next decade and beyond. My priorities for NATO 2030 are 
to ensure NATO remains a strong military alliance, becomes stronger politically, and takes a more global approach. Let me go briefly through each of them. First, we already are a strong military alliance. In fact, in recent years, we have had the biggest increase in our collective defense for a generation, with more investment, modern capabilities, and higher readiness of our forces. This must continue. I know that prioritizing defense spending in the middle of a health crisis is not easy. But the threats that existed before the pandemic have not diminished, on the contrary. So the commitment we all have made to invest more in defense is as relevant as ever. One of the reasons we need a strong military is for our fight against international terrorism, as we have been doing in Afghanistan for almost 20 years. As you know, the United States has announced that it will reduce its presence in Afghanistan. But the NATO mission will remain. And we will continue to provide support to Afghan security forces. No ally wants to stay in Afghanistan for longer than is necessary. But we cannot risk Afghanistan becoming once more a platform for international terrorists to plan and organize attacks on our homelands. And we cannot let ISIS rebuild in Afghanistan the terror caliphate it lost in Syria and Iraq. Therefore, we will address NATO's future presence in Afghanistan at our next defense ministers meeting in February. We will be faced with a difficult choice. Either stay and pay the price of a continued military engagement or leave and risk that the gains we have made are lost, and that the peace process falters. This is not the time to conclude. But we have to remember that we went into Afghanistan together, and when the time is right, we should leave together in an orderly and coordinated way. The second priority of NATO 2030 is to strengthen NATO as a political alliance. NATO is the only place where countries of Europe and North America meet every day. We need to build on this and use NATO even more as a forum for frank discussion on a wide range of security issues. From Russia to the Middle East, and from the security impacts of a rising China to climate change and arms control. As well as how we deal with the new and disruptive technologies. For NATO to become stronger politically, we must continue to acknowledge that, yes, we have our differences. We have had them in the past, and we have them now. We must continue to address any differences, frankly, as allies and as friends. This is what we have been doing, for instance, in the Eastern Mediterranean. NATO provided a platform for Greece and Turkey to come together on the basis of international law and allied solidarity, to establish a military deconfliction mechanism and to cancel some planned military exercises. This type of military deconfliction can prevent dangerous incidents and accidents in the Eastern Mediterranean, and it can create the opportunity for political discussions and diplomatic solutions to address underlying disputes. Even in the most heated debate, we should not forget that what unites us is stronger than what divides us. That ultimately, we are NATO allies, committed to our core mission to protect and defend one another, and committed to our core values, democracy, individual liberty, and the rule of law. Our voice is more powerful when we stand united. The third priority of NATO 2030 is to take a more global approach. We are a regional alliance and we will remain a regional alliance. But the challenges we face are increasingly global. Terrorism, cyber threats, 
the proliferation of nuclear weapons, pandemics and disinformation campaigns. None of our countries, even the biggest ones, can deal with such challenges alone. This is also true of our approach to China. China is not our enemy, but its rise is fundamentally shifting the global balance of power, bringing many opportunities, especially for our economies, but also challenges to our security and our technological edge, increasing the pressure on our values and our way of life, and multiplying the threats to open societies and individual freedoms. So the rise of China requires our continued collective attention to fully understand what it means for our security and to act accordingly, including by boosting the resilience of all our nations and by working even more closely with like-minded countries and with organizations like the European Union. To defend the global rules and institutions that have kept us safe for decades. I welcome the active contribution of NATO Parliamentary Assembly to NATO 2030, including through the survey of your members you conducted over the summer. Your written report and discussions with the expert group, the lively debate you had last month with the Deputy Secretary General, and the reports and resolutions to, the, uh, to be adopted later at this annual session. Your input will feed into my recommendations for NATO leaders when they meet next year. I'm also consulting with youth leaders, civil society, industry, and of course with allied capitals. All of you in the NATO Parliamentary Assembly play a crucial role in preparing NATO for the future as we look to 2030 and beyond. You ensure we stay safe militarily by deciding our defence budgets. You make us stronger politically by, by upholding our values, debating our differences and keeping our democracy strong. And you help us take a more global approach by bringing together well over 300 parliamentarians from all NATO allies, associated countries and observer delegations. So thank you for your many different contributions and for your continued support for NATO. I look forward to your comments and to your questions. Thank you very much, Mr. <coughs> General Secretary. Uh, and uh, now we come to the Q&A period. Uh, I would like to inform you that uh, the Secretary General has to leave at uh, 4.30. Therefore, I'm setting a one-minute limit for questions to ensure that as many delegates as possible can participate. I will call delegates to ask questions in groups of three. When I call delegates' names, uh, can they press the request to speak button on KUDO? After the questions have been asked, uh, the Secretary General uh, will reply these questions. So let's start the first three questions, and I would like to give the floor as uh, the first question to Marietta uh, Janakau, who is the head of the Greek delegation, and I would like to thank all the efforts you have done and your government, uh, the preparation of this meeting, and it's, we regret very much that we cannot be there in person, uh, but perhaps next time. So Marietta, please, the floor is yours. Chairperson, we are very glad to have you with us and of course the Secretary Generally, General and we fully support his initiative. This initiative, NATO 2030, can meet all these three objectives. We need a NATO which would be would have military force, will be politically united, and will play an international role. Within this framework, Secretary General, cooperation of NATO with the EU is of paramount importance. However, the 2016 declarations and 2018 declarations and the 74 common objectives are not moving forward. 
because a NATO member state does not recognize the EU as a, a total. How can you overcome this difficulty? Because the role of NATO and the EU in supporting democracy and the rule of law is very powerful internationally in order to improve situate the situation. Thank you very much. Question uh, from our uh, Vice President, Mr. Osman Bak, the head of the Turkish uh, delegation. Osman, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, General Secretary. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I will, for the, for, uh, for the past two decades, the EU has been deliberately excluding Turkey as a non-EU ally from its own defense-related initiatives. And NATO has not been successful in def defending the rights and interests of uh, non-EU uh, non allies vis-a-vis -vis the EU in despite of the agreements between the two organizations against this backdrop. Why should we assume that the EU's security and defense initiatives, which are obviously in the direction of a more autonomous union, are good for NATO? As you often suggest publicly, how do you plan to uphold non-EU allies' rights and interests in the time ahead? Yesterday, the German warship and helicopter working for Irani operations stopped and searched a Turkish commercial ship in an abusive and hostile manner. The ship was carrying some commercial goods and mostly humanitarian assistance. Don't you agree that this kind of exclusive and uncoordinated operations will further complicate and harm the alliance? Thank you. Thank you very much, Osman. And the third one, Karl Lammers, our vice president from uh, Germany, uh, our friend, head of delegation. Yeah, Secretary General, thank you very much for your great work in these turbulent times, for your excellent speech and kind regards from Berlin. The corona pandemic is having a big economic impact on all NATO member states. This means the GDP might go down and the 2% target might be reached more easily. But important for us is to increase the capabilities of NATO. Do you think that the NATO 2% target is still appropriate in these circumstances? Or do you believe that there are alternative ways of fair and effective burden sharing? Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, uh, Mr. General Secretary, the floor is yours. First, uh, I would like to say to the Greek representative, uh, Marietta, that, uh, that uh, uh, we all, of course, uh, very much would have liked to be in, uh, in Athens, uh, but we all understand that uh, because of the pandemic, uh, that's not possible. And then I think this virtual meeting is a, a good uh, alternative. Um, uh, uh, second, I had the pleasure of visiting uh, Athens uh, some weeks ago, uh, and it was good to sit down with uh, the Greek Prime Minister and, uh, and discuss the way forward, uh, also in some of the challenging issues we face when it comes to the situation in the Eastern uh, uh, Mediterranean. Uh, there are always some challenges when we try, try to expand and strengthen NATO-EU cooperation. But I strongly believe that uh, we have made significant progress. We have, uh, for the first time, uh, agreed statements, uh, created a political platform for further uh, strengthening the EU-NATO cooperation through the declarations I signed with President uh, Tusk and President Juncker in 16 and 18. We have identified uh, 74 different areas and we are working on uh, them uh, to deliver. Uh, meaning, for instance, things like um, uh, real-time uh, 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 warnings on cyber attacks, uh, sharing information on uh, on malware, uh, and um, and uh, we have also stepped up cooperation when it comes to exercises. I met uh, recently uh, President Ursula von der Leyen, uh, and one of the issues we there uh, discussed was how we can do more when it comes to, for instance, military mobility. So there are a wide range of areas where NATO and EU has a lot to do uh, uh, working together. Uh, yes, there are some challenges, as there has always been, but the reality is that we have been able to lift the NATO-EU cooperation up to unprecedented levels. We have never seen such uh, close cooperation between NATO and the EU as we do uh, today, and then we need to uh, continue to address some of the obstacles. 
Then Usman, um, it's uh, great to see you again. Uh, um, uh, again, in one way, it's uh, the same issue, uh, NATO-EU cooperation. Well, I, th I strongly believe that, first of all, we have to respect that NATO and the EU, we are two different organizations. We need to respect the integrity, the decision-making procedures of both EU and NATO. But as long as we do that, I think there is absolutely a value in uh, looking into how we can work together. Partly because we share the same, many, most of the same threats and challenges. We are in the same neighborhood. We are, uh, we are faced with the same uh, 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 security challenges. With the more assertive Russia, with the rise of China, with terrorism, with instability to the south, all of this is relevant for NATO and for EU countries. Second, we share uh, to a large uh, degree the same population. More than 90 percent of the people living in EU, they live in a NATO country. Uh, so for me, this highlights the importance of uh, uh, strengthening cooperation um, and also that, uh, that we have to make sure that uh, uh, we are able to include also all uh, non-EU members when we work together on concrete projects with, with, uh, with uh, the European Union uh, as, as NATO. Then uh, to Carl, um, first of all, again, great to see you again uh, too. Um, the burden sharing is about many things. It's about contributions to NATO missions and operations. Like, for instance, Germany is leading uh, uh, one of the lead nations in our presence in Afghanistan. Uh, or Germany is leading the battle group uh, NATO has deployed uh, uh, in, um, in Lithuania. Uh, so, so that is about contributions. So, ca so co contributions uh, and, uh, and capabilities are also part of uh, burden sharing with East Alliance. But that doesn't replace the importance of also have burden sharing when it comes to uh, spending to investing in our defense. And, and, uh, and uh, what we have seen, of course, is that with the pandemic, it, it, allies are faced with more demanding budgetary constraints. But the threats and the challenges that made us agree uh, to uh, the uh, defense investment pledge, the pledge to invest more, they have not gone away. Uh, they are still there. Uh, and we also saw during the pandemic that m the military has been extremely helpful and supportive and critical in providing support to the civilian health services dealing with uh, the pandemic. I have seen myself many places, uh, NATO and military uh, helping to set up field hospitals, transporting a lot of critical equipment uh, between NATO allies. And as I said, we also have now this stock in place that actually provided some extra help over the just last few uh, uh, few uh, weeks, um, and 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 so far we have seen no indication that um, the willingness of allies to invest in defense is going down. Actually, allies continue to be committed to the defense investment pledge. I know that there are many questions. So I try to be not too long, so that's uh, uh, as much as I have to say about the three four questions. Thank you so much uh, so far. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, and now the second round of questions. Uh, uh, in the second round, the first one is uh, Jerry Connolly, or incoming uh, uh, president. So, Jerry, uh, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Attila, and uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary General, for being with us again. Um, I, I guess I have two questions, if I may. One is we're going to be considering a resolution on China lately, and you stated. China is not our enemy, but you emphasize clearly China nonetheless represents a direct challenge to the liberal democratic values that bind the alliance together. Uh, and it is not shy about challenging those values and attempting on occasion to undermine uh, those societies that embrace those values. I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on how best you think the alliance going forward needs to organize itself to meet that challenge. And my second question may be a little more close to home, but as you undertake the work of looking at NATO 2030, um, how do you see the role of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly? Um, I, I believe that uh, we need a seat at the table as part of that process. Um, and I, I think all of us would like to hear how you envision that happening. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, Jerry. And now, um, Philippe uh, Michel Kleisbauer, the head of the French delegation. Michel? Merci à toi, Mr. Radzi, et félicitations pour cette présidence, la première hongroise que vous avez assumée avec beaucoup d'honneur. Monsieur le secrétaire général, le contexte international et stratégique est en profonde mutation et l'Alliance se penche sur son fonctionnement, ses missions et son concept stratégique. Le cœur de cette réflexion, c'est le respect des intérêts de sécurité et des valeurs qui unit notre Alliance. à démontrer, s'il en était encore besoin, à quel point l'initiative de la and show if the initiative of France and Germany is necessary. This strategic competition, you have said, Russia, but also sometimes allies go against the grain of the efforts of the international community. You took the responsibility of this uh, political reform of the alliance. What role do you see for uh, Northern Atlantic at the, out, uh, at the outcome of this reform? We need de-conflicting groups. Is this, do you agree with this? And in the framework, uh, of the consensus, which should be uh, the decision maker. Finally, do you think that uh, new means uh, can be found to help allies uh, uh, to improve uh, work on uh, collective defense? So I'm thinking here about what is being done by the European Union with uh, the budgetary tools that are being used uh, uh, to try to improve uh, uh, the standards in general. Thank you, Philippe. And now, uh, Alec Sherbrooke from the United Kingdom, the head of the British delegation. I hope we can put him on screen. Yeah. Alec, the floor is yours, please. Um, th thank you, Attila, and, and greetings, Mr. Secretary General from um, London. Um, I'd like to focus my question on the High North, an area in which the two state actors of most importance to NATO, China and Russia, have significant strategic interests. We know that China, as a near-Arctic state, has ambitions to build an Arctic Silk Road and is exercising in the Baltic Sea. We also know that Russia's submarine presence in the North Atlantic is now higher than it was in 1983, that its shipbuilding program is the third largest in the world, that it's currently re arming its northern sea fleet, building new icebreakers and frigates to protect the area closest to its northern sea routes, and that this area will be of increasing importance to her over the next few decades. In September this year, the UK demonstrated its commitment to the High North by leading a multinational task group into the region, sailing above Scandinavian countries into the North Cape, successfully operating in challenging sub-zero conditions, gaining valuable experience of operating in the frozen High North environment, and further enhancing the UK's cold weather capability. North Norway, Mr. Secretary General, is of course a fellow member of the Joint Expeditionary Force, the UK-led high readiness force of Northern Europe nations that is capable of countering hybrid and conventional threats as well as the Northern Group, a UK initiative formed of 12 nations aimed at providing effective defence and security cooperation in the region. But I'd like to know what short and medium term plans NATO itself is developing to ensure the protection of its own strategic interests in that area and what NATO is asking of member countries in terms of encouraging them to develop increased naval assets assets, drones, and Arctic-ready material. Thank you very much. And now the answers. Thank you so much. Uh, first uh, to Jerry. Um, I know that you are not yet elected as the next uh, president of the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, but as far as I understand, you are the only candidate. So I, I take the, 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 the risk of uh, congratulating you on the upcoming elections. I'm looking forward to, to working uh, with you. And it's also great to see you again. Uh, then uh, you asked... Um, uh, uh, about um, about uh, uh, China uh, and uh, and uh, w and and as NATO has to NATO has to address China in many different ways um, uh, and and again China is not an adversary China is not an enemy and we all know that the rise of China has been extremely important for our economies and it has helped to lift hundreds of millions of people out of uh, poverty. And this has been enormous progress for, for the people of China and, and for the rest of the world. Having said that, we are, of course, concerned about the fact that we now have a power which is becoming stronger and strong, stronger economically, technologically, and militarily that doesn't share our values. We have seen what they've done in, in Hong Kong, uh, undermining the democratic rights of the people living there, how, how, how China deal with, with minorities uh, in their own uh, country, and also how they... Uh, uh, behave, for instance, in the South China Sea, uh, or uh, in uh, in approaching um, 
countries all over the world, uh, for instance, when it comes to countries which behave in a way that China doesn't like. We have seen it against Australia, we have seen it against uh, Canada, we have seen it against Sweden. And when I was Prime Minister in Norway uh, uh, some years ago, uh, the Norwegian Nobel Committee awarded a peace prize to a Chinese dissident, and actually China then uh, tried to converse, coerce Norway to, uh, to, 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 to issue a public uh, excuse uh, for that decision. We didn't do so, but it just shows the way China is behaving, uh, trying to intimidate, coerce other countries to, to act uh, uh, in accordance with their uh, uh, wishes. I think that the main response to this is that, that we have to stand together, uh, both when it comes to responding politically, uh, but also investing in technology, uh, uh, military capabilities, um, uh, standing together. And when I go to the United States, I sometimes hear uh, concerns from uh, politicians, uh, decision makers in the United States that, that they are concerned about the size of China, that their, the economy of China soon will be bigger than the US economy. Uh, they have investments in military capabilities, they lead in some technological uh, areas. Um, and, and, then I, and then my answer is that, well, if you're concerned about the size of China, then it's even more important for the United States to keep friends and allies close. And that's exactly uh, why NATO is so important uh, for the United States, not only for Europe. Uh, and the rise of China, if anything, it just makes NATO even more relevant and even more uh, uh, important. Um, uh, I strongly believe, um, yeah, then very briefly, resilience uh, of our society is also part of how we need to deal with some of the threats and challenges we see from rising China. Then, um, uh, NATO 2030, I really believe that uh, uh, the, the, the North Atlantic uh, Parliamentary Assembly, uh, the NATO Parliamentary Assembly, can play and has already played an important role uh, in, uh, in NATO 2030. Putting forward all the, your ideas, sending, uh, submitting your proposals, uh, your, your survey and everything you have done as part of uh, this project. But I also strongly believe that you can be important in, in the future. Uh, because one of the main objectives of NATO 2030 is to strengthen NATO as a political alliance, bringing together North America and Europe, the only place that that happens every day, and also being a place where we can have frank and open discussions when we disagree. Uh, because I think the only way to address differences is not to shy away also from discussing them. And there I think actually the NATO Parliamentary Assembly is a perfect platform, because you bring together so many countries, uh, um, uh, allies, partners, uh, observing delegations, uh, and you have a long tradition of having open and frank discussions. So I think uh, the NATO Parliamentary Assembly as a political platform uh, will be even more important in uh, the future. Then, uh, Philippe, um, 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 so I welcome uh, EU efforts on defense. Uh, I think that's uh, helpful and important. Um, and of course, for instance, the only way for, for, for European countries to become stronger militarily is by investing more in, in, uh, in their armed forces. And NATO has called for more defense investments for years. So when European allies now uh, really have started to invest more, then that is something we absolutely welcome. Uh, so uh, more defense investment by European allies uh, is something which is good and something that NATO has been asking for for many, many years. So it will be strange, strange if we were uh, to uh, was regret that uh, uh, because we actually asked for it to happen. The same when it comes to defense industry. Uh, one of the challenges, and this is not me saying, but actually the European Union says, but I, I agree, uh, is that one of the main challenges the European uh, also countries have is the fragmentation of their defense industry. There are so many different types of uh, battle tanks, of, of helicopters, of, 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 uh, of uh, all kind of frigates, uh, ships. So the cost per unit, the cost per, per plane or per battle tank is much higher than when you have large amounts and, uh, and large numbers, uh, the economy of scale. Uh, uh, and therefore, uh, any effort to try to overcome this, uh, this fragmentation of the European defence industry, we welcome, we have called for, and we strongly support. Uh, and therefore, I think that the potential of, uh, of some of these mechanisms, like the European Defence Fund and so on, <clears throat> can be uh, extremely helpful. 
Um, so this is something we support. Uh, having said that, the, the only message we have is that this will have to have to happen within a NATO framework, meaning that that of course to strengthen uh, uh, NATO European NATO allies uh, cannot happen outside. Uh, 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 NATO, because NATO has the core responsibility for the security of European uh, NATO uh, members, um, and any a, any attempt to re also, EU cannot defend Europe. Eighty percent of NATO's defense expenditures comes from non-EU uh, allies. Um, uh, three of the four battle groups we have uh, in the eastern part of uh, Europe are led by non-EU. Uh, allies, uh, the United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom, and this is not only about battle groups or 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 or, or numbers or so spending, but it's also about geography. In the north, you have Norway, extremely important for the strategic high north, uh, the Barents Sea, uh, North Atlantic, uh, Iceland, uh, and then <clears throat> in the south, you have uh, several countries, but also Turkey, uh, very important for fighting terrorism and instability to the south. And then in, in the west you have uh, United States, Canada, but also uh, uh, the United Kingdom, the, 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 the largest defense spender in Europe, uh, out, but it's outside EU. So EU efforts on defense, we strongly support, but EU cannot replace NATO. Um, and, uh, and any attempt to, to weaken the transatlantic bond will, will of course, weaken NATO if we divide Europe and, and, uh, and North America. But it will also divide Europe, uh, because many European allies, they will understand that then they need to make bilateral arrangements with uh, North America. I believe in multilateral institutions, and therefore I believe in a strong NATO, uh, bringing Europe and uh, North America uh, together. Um, then uh, uh, Alec of, from the United Kingdom, High North. Uh, oh has been, still is, uh, uh, very important for NATO. Uh, if anything, it becomes more important with the melting of the ice and more Russian uh, military capabilities and uh, also increased uh, Chinese interest uh, for, the, for, the, uh, for the High North. Um, we said uh, always before, I remember, that High North should be characterized by uh, low tensions. That's still my aim, but the increased military presence, of course, makes that a bit more uh, difficult. But I think that we should continue to have a dual track approach, dialogue, but also then presence <clears throat> and strength. So NATO has increased its presence in the high north. Uh, we expect allies to invest in key capabilities. The UK has already started to invest in some uh, more uh, <clears throat> naval capabilities, maritime patrol aircrafts. Denmark, Norway, Canada, the US have done the same. Um, um, uh, uh, anti-submarine capabilities. Um, we need to protect uh, the North Atlantic. We need to protect all the cables, uh, which actually are key for transmission of more than ninety, also almost all data, which is uh, uh, so, uh, which is uh, so transmitted by 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 cables. And then uh, and then uh, uh, we need more exercises. We had the Trident Juncture exercise, where actually for the first time in decades we had a. Uh, aircraft carrier <coughs> deployed in the in the northern part of the Atlantic, and we also had this UK and also a U US uh, um, uh, naval presence in the in the Barents Sea. Uh, all of this uh, uh, shows that NATO is stepping up. Uh, part of NATO defense planning process is that we identify specific capability targets for each and every ally, and that also includes maritime uh, uh, capabilities, which are highly relevant for the High uh, North. The last thing I would say is that we have established this North, um, the, the new uh, NATO command for North Atlantic in Norfolk, Virginia, and that uh, also demonstrates the increased weight we give to uh, the North Atlantic and the High North. Thank you very much. <clears throat> the third round is uh, uh, Oyas Kalnins uh, from Latvia, is uh, the head of the Latvian uh, delegation. I would like to give him the floor. Yes, please, Oya. Secretary General, uh, greetings from Riga, Latvia. 
and also from the EFP troops that are stationed here, including our newest member, Iceland. We're very happy to have Iceland join the EFP battalion. Uh, my question is very simple, and it's about the Open Skies Treaty. Today, formally, the United States leaves this treaty. Uh, and I was wondering if you could say something about how this would impact NATO, uh, our strategies, policies. Is this being also looked at within the NATO 2030 program? And do you see any prospect of perhaps the new administration uh, rejoining the Open Skies Treaty? Thank you. Thank you very much, Oyars. And now, uh, Luca uh, Fussone from Italy, Italian head of delegation. Luca. Grazie mille, buonasera a tutti. Thank you and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for having spoken about NATO as a forum for debate and, di and diplomacy. This must always be underscored. But let me ask you my question. You also spoke about Afghanistan in your remarks. And over and above the development of this very important mission, I think we all need to learn a lesson in connection with that very mission. There are some concepts like the stability policing notion might be an instrument that we might uh, consider strengthening and therefore using uh, more and more in the future. So this is my question to you, Secretary General, with regard to the uh, 2030 process Shouldn't we include something of this kind? How do you think this might develop in the future? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now, uh, Christian uh, Tibring Gjede from, uh, from Norway, head of delegation, of course. Yeah, Christian, please. General uh, Jens, if I may call you Jens. Uh, I asked you this uh, question earlier uh, in Norwegian, and you visited in Norway last time you were here. I was talking about the superior values of NATO, and we all agree that uh, the NATO nations have cons uh, superior values uh, compared to many other nations in, in the world. But right now we are f fighting and defending those values with weapons in hand in, in Afghanistan, for example. Uh, and um, we've done this for 19 years. It made a lot of sense, of course, when you went in there to take uh, al-Qaeda leader bin Laden out and, and fighting the Taliban. Uh, but there are some, a lot of challenges left in Afghanistan, and um, we're still there. And um, is there any, uh, you have any ideas or any, um, let's say, proposals for what it means to be uh, victorious in Afghanistan? How can you find an exit strategy if we cannot stay there forever? And what does it mean to win in Afghanistan? Could we declare victory? And how do you declare victory? And what has to happen to declare victory? Thank you. First, uh, the question from Latvia on open uh, skies. I, I cannot and I will not uh, speculate about uh, what the... Uh, New U.S. administration will uh, uh, say about that issue. Uh, there is one president at a time in the United States, and uh, and uh, the, the the transition will take place on the 20th of uh, January. And until then, we work with the current uh, U.S. administration. I will not speculate about uh, what the new administration will uh, uh, say or think about the Open Skies uh, 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 Treaty. Uh, what I can say is, of course, that. We have all seen that there are some differences between NATO allies on that uh, issue. The United States have, has decided to leave, uh, uh, while uh, all the other allies have decided to stay in the Open Skies uh, Treaty because they believe that the uh, treaty uh, contributes to transparency and uh, predicti predictability about military uh, uh, posture uh, uh, in uh, the different countries which are part of the uh, treaty. Uh, uh, at the same time, all allies agree that uh, Russia uh, has um, imposed uh, restrictions inconsistent uh, with uh, the treaty. They have restricted uh, the possibility of uh, NATO allies to fly over uh, all the Russian uh, territory, including Kaliningrad. And uh, we have seen some kind of selective implementation by Russia of its obligations under the Open Skies uh, uh, Treaty. So these are concerns we all have. Uh, but uh, then uh, there are uh, some differences on uh, what kind of consequences uh, we should draw from uh, the selective Russian implementation of the Open Skies uh, Treaty. Um, then uh, Italy, um, 
Well, if I understood you right, it was about what the lessons we can learn uh, from Afghanistan. Uh, and and uh, and uh, to some extent, uh, this is also uh, what uh, Christian uh, from Norway asked me about. Um, I think I think we all have to be honest and and I'll admit that the most difficult decisions we uh, take as allies and as an, as an alliance is when to use military power and not uh, and and when to not use military power. And the problem is that we never know what would have happened if we hadn't used military power or vice versa. But what we know is that, for instance, I remember <laughs> because that was when I was still a, 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 a younger politician in the 1990s that the international community was very much criticized for not using military power to stop the atrocities we saw in Rwanda in the 1990s. Then we were criticized again for not stopping the atrocities in Bosnia Herzegovina and, uh, and, for instance, stopping Srebrenica. So then, actually, we decided to start to use military power when we saw uh, the atrocities uh, continued and the fighting in Bosnia Herzegovina continued, and NATO was key. NATO troops, NATO uh, mission in, in, in Bosnia Herzegovina was key to. Uh, end the war there, end the fighting there, stop the atrocities, and lay the foundation for the Dayton Agreement, which we actually celebrated, I think it was yesterday, uh, the 25th uh, uh, anniversary of the Dayton Agreement. I'm not saying that everything is fine in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but I'm saying that compared to where we were in the 90s, when there was a bloody war going on, at least NATO has helped, and the use of military power helped in the 1990s to stop a terrible war, to stop atrocities, and help to create the foundations for at least a state which is functioning with all its challenges, with all its problems, but much better than where we were before NATO went in with military uh, uh, power. Um, uh, uh, Serbia and Kosovo, uh, uh, a few years later, I think most people would deem that that was a necessary uh, um, uh, uh, use of military power that helped to uh, uh, stop uh, fighting and uh, create the conditions for um, uh, a development which has been more in accordance with our values than what we saw uh, before we went in and used military power. Um, in Syria, we have not used power. Um, and, uh, well, it's not going in the right direction. Uh, we used military power in Libya. At least we stopped uh, attacks against civilians. Um, and it's very hard to, in a way, compare two different countries, two different si situations, but it illustrates at least, at least that there is a cost of using military power, but there's also a cost of not using military power. So there's a cost of action, but there's also a cost of uh, inaction. And in Afghanistan, again, I can, I can spend hours telling you about all the problems in Afghanistan, all the risks we are faced with, but we have to remember that the reason we went into Afghanistan was to prevent Afghanistan from being a safe haven for international terrorists. And we have achieved that. And, uh, and, uh, uh, and now the question is, can we leave and, and, and still uh, 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 prevent that from happening? That will not be an easy de uh, decision. Uh, uh, but my only message is that whatever we do, we need to do it coordinated and in an orderly way. Uh, and also take into account that not so many years ago, we had more than 100,000 NATO troops in the combat operation there. Now we are uh, less than uh, 11,000 uh, uh, troops in the train assist and advice mission. Uh, so the, pr the character and the size and the, and, the, and the scope of the NATO presence in Afghanistan is totally different uh, from uh, what it was just a few years ago. I think that Luca asked me, so, so my answer to Kistan is that, yeah, our values can, uh, requires sometimes that we are willing to use military force. And fundamentally, military force is also about delivering deterrence, uh, protecting uh, our own uh, nations, uh, but also, for instance, using military force to fight ISIS uh, in Iraq and Syria. We would never have liberated uh, the territories controlled by ISIS without using military force. But military force is not the only answer, and it's not always the right answer. And, 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 and the challenge is to find out and to decide when to use military force and what to not do uh, so. Uh, the last thing I would say about Afghanistan is that I think that one of the lessons learned from Afghanistan, and this is to Luca, is that, uh, is that 
the sooner we can start to build local capacity, to train local forces, to build local security institu institutions, uh, the better. If there's any lesson learned, or at least one lesson learned from Afghanistan, uh, that will be that we should perhaps have started earlier to, to train the Afghans, to enable the Afghans to stabilize their own country. Uh, training local forces is one of the best weapons we have in the fight against terrorism, and therefore I think it's extremely important that we, for instance, do that in Iraq as NATO uh, uh, does now, and I, we plan to s scale up the training mission in Iraq, because that's the best way uh, to prevent ISIS from coming back, and also the best way to prevent, to create a situation where we are forced to come back in a full-scale uh, military uh, uh, operation. So then I actually I think I also answered both uh, Norway and Italy uh, at the same time. Thank you. And now two of my uh, vice presidents. Uh, first, Mr. Philippe Folio from France. Uh, Philippe? Yes, hello. Secretary General, I wanted to ask you a question related to the 2% issue. We can see that with the uh, crisis, GDP has fallen in several countries, or actually in most countries in the alliance. And even though we will have a level that will be the same uh, in terms of defense spending, in relative terms, it, it will increase the percentage of defense spending uh, for allied states, even though there will not be any extra money. And therefore, I would like to understand if, in your opinion, the 2% target is still something that has to be reached or shouldn't it be adapted given the current situation because the situation will not be exactly what had been planned because the even though the allies will try to reach this two percent um, there will be a fall in GDP in allied countries, so the amount will be different. So there will not be a greater spending in defense. Thank you very much, uh, Philip. And now Lord uh, Campbell from the United Kingdom. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary General. It's always a pleasure to listen to you. You have a, a direct <laughs> and uh, comprehensible way of dealing with these things, and it's much appreciated. I want to talk, well, first of all, can I say I support very much what you said about common procurement and the need to try and do more of that to get more value for our money. And second, what you said about Bosnia. As a member of the United Kingdom Defence Committee, I went there on several occasions at the height of the troubles. And it may not be perfect, but it's one hell of a lot better than it once was. Can I ask you this? Uh, does NATO at 2030 now have to have a new strategic concept? I say that because the traditional domains of land, sea and air have now been added to by space and cyber. Should we not be taking account of these changes? Thank you, Ming. And now uh, Mike Turner from the uh, United States. Yeah. Well, the Secretary General, uh, <clears throat> hello from Dayton, Ohio. Good to see you. Uh, I greatly appreciate your commitment to working with the uh, NATO Parliamentary Assembly and, of course, our, our President Attila and uh, your pledge to work uh, with Jerry Connolly, our incoming president. We're very proud as a U.S. delegation of his upcoming leadership. Uh, I want to thank you for your strong words with respect to Afghanistan. They've been very important here in the United States as we have been taking up in Congress the debate on the issue of Afghanistan and the drawdown of forces. Uh, they've been very helpful, and I greatly appreciate them. Uh, my question is a, sort of a follow-on to Lord Campbell's. As you look to 2030, you identified that China is not an adversary or an enemy. Certainly, we don't identify Russia as that either. Uh, but their modernization efforts certainly do look at threats, which should be translated for us into capabilities. In the United States, we look at the potential adversaries' capabilities and how they can be a threat when we try to scope and fashion our own. I chair the Defense Committee, and yesterday we were told of Russia's modernization. They identified their nuclear weapons as the most modern in the world, and of course, they're pointed at us. Um, how in the 2030 process are you looking to the modernization of our adversaries and how that might uh, be a, uh, a map, if you will, of what we need to undertake? Thank you. 
Uh, first, uh, to Philip, uh, about the 2%. Uh, you are absolutely right, uh, and, and, and you have a valid and, and very relevant point. And I think also I was asked that question uh, a bit earlier uh, in this same uh, round of questions. Um, and of course, what matters for NATO and for our uh, uh, defenses in the different uh, allied countries is uh, uh, the absolute number of money invested in our defense. Um, so the percentage in itself is not, uh, is, is not in a way what decides whether we have enough money or not. Uh, it is uh, the absolute number of uh, dollars or euros or, or whatever it is uh, that we are making available for our armed forces, for our defense budgets. Uh, why the G and of course when GDP goes down, uh, some uh, or then then the percentage uh, will go up, uh, even without any increase in defense spending. That's in a way obvious. Uh, but I think that the two percent uh, 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 guideline still matters for a couple of reasons. First of all, the size of the economy says something about the ability, the strength. Uh, the uh, kind of income uh, for an uh, for an ally to to uh, to spend. Uh, so when we speak about burden sharing, of course, a, a country with uh, with a very small economy uh, uh, compared to a country with a big economy, we need we need one way to be able to compare. Then it's it's not fair in a way to to look at the total defense spending of a country like uh, Norway and compare that to the total defense spending of uh, of uh, of United Kingdom or U.S. with uh, many times as a big economy. And we know that in, in, in NATO we have even smaller countries with even smaller GDPs. So, so the reality is that we need a way to compare. And then GDP makes sense because that reflects the size of the economy. Uh, and that's the reason why we also use 2% uh, when we speak about burden sharing. Um, so I think uh, the 2% guideline still is important for uh, comparing uh, burden sharing uh, between uh, allies. Uh, absolute numbers make zero sense uh, when you try to compare when we have so different size of of, uh, of the economies. Uh, second, we all hope that that uh, the GDP will start to grow again. So I agree that um, this year, maybe in the next year, there will be you know some allies increasing their share, uh, not because they spend more, but because GDP is going down. Uh, having said that, even with the current uh, estimates for GDP, the majority of NATO allies will not be at 2%, so it's a plenty of room to increase. And remember also that, that in the Wales Declaration, they refer to the 2% as minimum. So if I don't, I don't, also if, if allies are able to spend more than 2%, they're more than welcome. But what we have said is that the 2% should be something we all uh, try to move uh, towards. So uh, I, I hope that I have answered your question. I, I, for, also I agree that absolute numbers is what counts at the end of the day. Uh, GDP matters because it says something about uh, burden sharing when you compare nations. Uh, second, GDP will hopefully start to increase again. And uh, thirdly, it's absolutely possible to spend more than 2%, and some allies already do. Uh, for instance, the UK just presented a, uh, a defense plan uh, where they actually increase uh, further uh, over two uh, percent, and the United States also spends clearly more than two uh, percent. I think it's three point five or something like that. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, so that's uh, that's about two percent. Um, uh, then, uh, Lord uh, Campbell. Um, so, first of all, uh, I think the time has come uh, to update our strategic concept um, for many reasons, um, uh, but not but not least for the reasons you mentioned. Uh, space, cyber, new challenges, new threats, and uh, I think that the process of updating our strategic concept will improve our understanding and at least improve our common understanding of the threats and challenges we are faced with. So therefore, uh, I think the time has come to, uh, to conduct that process of uh, updating the strategic concept. I don't expect that to happen at the upcoming uh, heads of state uh, also leaders meeting or summit. Uh, uh, in 2021, uh, but uh, uh, I hope that the leaders will be able to agree to uh, to, to task me to, to do that process, and then at the, at the uh, leaders meeting after that, um, uh, they can then agree a new strategic concept. Uh, then uh, 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 Mike Turner again. Mike, it's great to see you again, and uh, it's always great to also see you in the United States when I go there to the Congress, and you always. 
you are such a great supporter of NATO, and you know NATO very very well, and you at least, uh, and especially know the NATO Parliamentary Assembly uh, very well. Um, um, China, well, one of the main purposes of uh, of uh, of uh, NATO 2030 is to make NATO more global, uh, no, and to have to make NATO have a more global approach. Uh, then, then, then I know that some people get a bit scared because they think that that means that we should start to have members from all over the world. No, I don't think so. I think that NATO should remain a regional alliance, North America and Europe. But <clears throat> the fact is that the threats we face are more global and, and the challenges we face are more global. And of course, this is not moving NATO into uh, also the South China Sea. But it is about taking into account that China is coming so much closer to us in cyber, um, uh, in our infrastructure, uh, and we need, uh, uh, and also their military capabilities uh, are more and more long ranging. So, of course, all of this matters for NATO when we assess, uh, analyze potential threats and challenges we will face in the future. Um, China is a great power, uh, they don't share our values. Uh, and therefore, we need to stand up for our values. We need to work with like-minded countries. And I believe especially that we should strengthen further our cooperation with like-minded countries in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, I visited Japan, uh, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, four strong, dedicated, committed uh, partners of NATO. They all want to work more closely with NATO. And I think that our political response to uh, the political challenges we see from China not sharing our core values, democracy, individual li li liberties, just makes that cooperation with, uh, with uh, other uh, like-minded partners even more important. Then we see a significant military modernization going on in China, all of the second largest defense budget, investing heavily in modern capabilities. And combined with new advanced disruptive te technologies, like for instance, artificial intelligence. That just underpins the importance of NATO investing in, uh, in defense, in military capabilities, but also, of course, in technology, and that we bring uh, all, us all together, including uh, in working with our industries, to make sure that we maintain the technological edge, which has been so important for NATO for decades. And the third uh, area I will mention is, of course, resilience. We see more and more Chinese investments in critical infrastructure, in, in ports, in airfields, in, uh, <clears throat> in, in airports, in, in, in railways, uh, and also in telecommunications, uh, 5G. And we have agreed some baseline requirements in NATO to make sure that our uh, infrastructure is safe, our telecommunications are safe and secure, including in, in those baseline requirements is that they have to address the risks uh, related to foreign ownership, foreign control, uh, of uh, critical infrastructure, uh, including 5G. So we need to do more on uh, resilience, we need to do more on technology and defense uh, spending, and we need to stand up for our values, working with like-minded partners when it comes to protecting our political uh, values. That's at least some of the things we need to uh, do as part of NATO 2030 and, uh, and beyond. Thank you very much. And now Utku Zakiroser from Turkey. Secretary General, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. Uh, I would like to ask you, uh, how do you assess the situation in Nagorno-Karabakh after the recent agreement, which has been struck by Russia? Both are Azerbaijan and Armenia are partners of this alliance. Don't you think a more determined stance by NATO uh, would have been consistent with uh, the alliance's principal stance on territorial integrity of its partners in the region, such as Georgia uh, and Ukraine? Do you think that NATO NATO's anodine stance vis-à-vis -vis this recent conflict it was a mistake and, uh, and NATO has thus left an unrented space to Russia, which now uh, dis uh, deployed peacekeepers in the region. And what might be the region regional uh, and global strategic and tactical consequences of Russia's increased military presence in this region? Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Jürgen uh, Trittin uh, from Germany. Yes. Um, I have two questions. The first one is, you referred that NATO will discuss the problem of Afghanistan in February. If it's come true, what is very likely, that the more or less unconditioned withdrawal of the US will take place 
December or January, don't you think that February is a little late? The second question I have is with a reverence to Vice President Osman. It's, to be very frank, Turkey is not sharing the values of NATO. In Turkey is no rule of law. But now the Erdogan regime has reached a new level, threatening vessels of NATO partner Germany today, of NATO partner France some months ago. Massive breach of a UN arms embargo on Libya. Turkey is violating Europe's exclusive economic zone. And they enabled Azerbaijan to break the OSCE truce in Nagorno Karabakh. Shouldn't we look at Turkey not as a partner, but as a spoiler and a threat to NATO? Thank you very much. And uh, in this round, Yegor uh, Chernia from Ukraine, the head of the delegation. Um, greetings from Kiev, uh, Ukraine, dear Secretary General, um, dear distinguished colleagues. Unfortunately, Russia continues its aggressive policy towards the countries of Eastern Europe and the Black Sea region threatening not only their neighbors, but also global security. The militarization of the Black Sea has reached unprecedented proportion, and according to some sources, nuclear weapons have already been deployed in Crimea. The civilized world can only resist this threat together. And with, without the uh, active participation of Ukraine, which de facto is already the eastern flank of NATO, it will be very difficult to constrain Russia. In our opinion, it would be logical and useful for all countries adhering the, to democratic values to jointly resist the Russia Federation as aliens. And, and an important step for this would be the provision of MAP to Ukraine as implementation of the decision of Bukharest Summit 2008. But for now, I would like to ask you, dear Secretary General, what steps NATO will take in the near future to constrain Russia in the Black Sea and facilitate the demilitarization of this region. Thank you. Thank you very much. Another answer. First, uh, on uh, Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, the other question from uh, from uh, uh, Turkey. Um, you're absolutely right that uh, both <coughs> Armenia and um, <coughs> sorry um, and Azerbaijan are uh, partners of uh, NATO, but uh, but. Uh, <clears throat> NATO is not uh, part of uh, the conflict in Nagorno-Karabakh, and uh, and uh, I, I think it's important to, to 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 be aware of that also because that's also the reason why uh, we have not, of course, uh, been involved in the conflict. Uh, we uh, welcome the cessation of hostilities. Uh, we uh, we take note of the. A recently signed uh, a, a agreement, uh, and we strongly uh, uh, call on uh, all sides to refrain from uh, uh, actions uh, that uh, could uh, lead to the resumption of hostilities uh, again. And then we also believe that uh, uh, unresolved uh, issues uh, should be uh, dealt with at the negotiating table, uh, not uh, on the battlefield. And uh, and uh, and we hope uh, uh, that that can can now be uh, the case as we move uh, uh, forward. Uh, then uh, the question was on um, on uh, from from Jürgen from uh, Germany again. Good to see you again. Um, um, the U.S. has not decided to withdraw to leave uh, to leave. Uh, uh, Afghanistan. Uh, what the U.S. has decided is to uh, reduce. Uh, their number of troops from uh, uh, 4,500 to 2,500. Uh, at the same time, the U.S. has made it absolutely clear, uh, <clears throat> and our military commanders have um, confirmed that uh, that uh, that they have um, uh, they will maintain uh, what we call enablers as the support, especially uh, aviation support, helicopter support. Uh, 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 fixed wing and rotary wing support to the NATO uh, missions, including the German mission in Mashar, which has been extremely important uh, uh, element part of, of of the NATO presence uh, in uh, in Afghanistan. Um, um, uh, but the reason why I believe that the defense ministerial meeting in NATO in February will be so so important is that uh, the United States and um, and Taliban signed an agreement, and this agreement has been welcomed by all NATO allies. And in that agreement, it is stated that, that all international troops 
should be out of Afghanistan by the 1st of May. Uh, at the same time, we know that this is a condition-based. We, we will only leave if Taliban has met their uh, side of the agreement. Uh, so, um, yeah, early next year, um, around the Defense Ministerial meeting, uh, we need to uh, assess whether we believe that Taliban meets the conditions, uh, uh, and uh, therefore we need to then decide whether we think the time has come to leave Afghanistan. Um, risking uh, that we can lose uh, the gains we have made, including risking that Taliban will be back controlling the country, and of course that ISIS can also gain ground and try to re-establish the caliphate, the terror caliphate they lost in Iraq and Syria. They will try to re-establish that in, uh, in, uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, or we can stay, but then of course uh, we will then be involved uh, once again in, in a uh, yeah, uh, military uh, presence in Afghanistan, which has a high price economically, but not least politically, and most important of all, the, uh, 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 when it comes to human lives. So I'm only, only saying that this is an extremely difficult decision. Uh, we all saw the importance of using military power to, uh, to defeat ISIS in Iraq and, uh, and Syria. Um, uh, we all know the risk that if we leave too early from Afghanistan, they can come back there. Uh, but at the same time, we have been there for many, many years. So there are also many allies who are now looking for the possibilities to try to reduce their presence in Afghanistan. My message today is that whatever we decide, uh, we have to do it in a, in a coordinated way. We should avoid any rush to the exit, any, any, any attempts by individual allies to take unilateral uh, decisions. And I welcome the strong commitment of Germany and also the clear message from Germany to be coordinated with other allies. Then, uh, also, so, um, uh, Turkey. Turkey is a, 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 a Turkey is a valued ally. Um, uh, uh, and an and, and important ally um, because they um, they play a key role, for instance, in the fight against uh, international terrorism. They, the, Turkey is the only country bordering Iraq and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Syria. They have been uh, important in uh, providing the infrastructure, the platforms for, the, for liberating the territory controlled by ISIS. No other ally suffer more uh, uh, terrorist attacks than, uh, than Turkey, and no other ally hosts more refugees, uh, close to 4 million refugees. At the same time, there are some issues and there are uh, some concerns, uh, uh, and I have expressed those concerns uh, related to, for instance, the consequences of the Turkish decision to acquire S-400 air defense system, uh, uh, the situation in the Eastern Mediterranean, uh, Libya and and other uh, uh, issues. Uh, I have raised these uh, these uh, uh, issues in Ankara. Uh, I also stated clearly that NATO is founded on some core values: uh, the rule of law, democracy, individual liberty, and I uh, uh, attach great importance to those values myself. But I strongly believe that NATO is a platform where allies, when they disagree on issues, be it Eastern Mediterranean or S-400 or any other issue then we use NATO as a platform to at least address those values and see how we can try to reduce tensions and, and try to find some kind of uh, unity, uh, as we try to do with the deconfliction mechanism that was established at NATO uh, to reduce the in risk for incidents and accidents in the Eastern Mediterranean between uh, two valued NATO allies, Turkey and, uh, and Greece. Then uh, on, on Ukraine uh, um, and the Black Sea, uh, we are stepping up. Uh, we are. Uh, we have increased our presence in the Black Sea region. We're working with Ukraine. We're working with uh, with, uh, with 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 Georgia. And of course, we have also uh, NATO members who are literal uh, literal states: uh, Turkey, Bulgaria, Romania. Uh, 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 and uh, and uh, and we have increased our co uh, so cooperation with our two valued partners: uh, uh, Ukraine and Georgia. Uh, we will also have a foreign ministerial meeting uh, next week. And there we have a dedicated session to Black Sea security. And we will invite the foreign minister of Ukraine and the foreign minister of uh, Georgia to participate in that uh, meeting. Thank you. Now, the last round of questions. Uh, Nial uh, Fridbertson, who is the head of the delegation of the Icelandic delegation. Nial, please request the floor. Uh, dear Secretary General, I want to start by expressing my contentment to see that there will be a special debate here today on furthering the implementation 
of the landmark resolution of the United Nations Security Council 3025 on women, peace and security. The resolution that celebrated its 20th anniversary last month was the first to recognize the important roles that women play in peace and security. Opinion polls show that women are less supportive of NATO and are less familiar with the alliance. Efforts to address these weaknesses are welcomed, but more needs to be done. Mr. Secretary General, in parallel to pursuing more ambitious policies on gender equality, do you see increased focus within the Alliance on issues relating to gender equality and will NATO strengthen public di dipl diplomacy efforts aimed at women in its future work? Thank you. Thank you very much. And now Osman Bak from the Turkish uh, delegation. Thank you very much, uh, uh, General Secretary, uh, for uh, your comments about Turkey, uh, for concerning value uh, NATO ally, and for your uh, assessment concerning the uh, issues, conflicts. Uh, we, we are always open to dialogue. But uh, for, I would like to say that. I don't agree with a uh, German colleague, uh, which was he spent about uh, Turkey and uh, uh, our uh, president, uh, what he said. He, I condemn uh, what he said about uh, uh, Turkey and uh, our president. Turkey is a democratic country. Uh, Turkey is a, a valued ally, and Turkey is taking all parts in all NATO missions. Turkey, as Mr. General Secretary mentioned, only country fight against ISIS chest to chest on the ground in Syria. So they all know this issue. So there are, of course, uh, uh, problems within the Eastern Mediterranean and other issues could be discussed. And I always uh, attend uh, the meetings with uh, our president and Mr. Secretary General in Ankara. So thank you very much for his uh, uh, comments about Turkey. And uh, I don't uh, accept what uh, German colleague uh, said about Turkey. Uh, he saw his face. Thank you. Thank you very much, Osman. And now, uh, uh, Tanasis uh, Davakis from the Greek delegation, deputy head of the delegation, and uh, he will end uh, the Q&A session. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Secretary, in the field of uh, cybersecurity and defense, how do you see NATO moving towards deeper cooperation with the private sector. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, Secretary General, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, first, when it comes to Iceland, um, uh, women, peace and security is of uh, great importance for uh, NATO. I personally uh, is, uh, really believe that this is important for uh, the alliance. But of course, it's also extremely important for women uh, in the countries where we are operating. We have spoken a lot about Afghanistan and the importance of not NATO uh, leaving too early. There are many reasons for, uh, for that. Uh, the main reason why we're there is, is to fight international terrorism. But we just have to understand that the NATO presence in Afghanistan has, made a, has helped to make enormous progress for women. Uh, uh, before we came, um, women were denied the right to take education. And we had, uh, you know, uh, uh, a brutality when it comes to uh, dealing or, and uh, and uh, with women, which 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 is uh, hard to imagine, and and now uh, uh, women has a much stronger position in Afghanistan than they had for many years, um, including in leading positions in uh, politics, uh, in the parliament, in media, in culture, and uh, and in academia. This will be threatened um, if uh, NATO leaves too early, and I think it shows that NATO presence is a way to try to also strengthen uh, the role of women and empower women. That's also the reason why we have gender advisors in our uh, missions, uh, and, and we focus on training uh, 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 women. I have seen myself in, in, uh, in both uh, Afghanistan and Iraq how we train uh, uh, women, um, and for instance, Afghanistan I saw women or female pilots trained by uh, NATO. That was uh, good for the Afghan uh, Air Force, but also good for uh, creating new role models for women in a country like uh, Afghanistan. Um, sexual violence is something we uh, 
um, so say focus a lot on uh, to make sure that that's not used as part of armed uh, conflict. So we will continue. Uh, and uh, for instance, our training mission in Iraq has a gender perspective uh, because we know that uh, women, peace and security is important for the whole alliance. Um, uh, then uh, uh, Osman, uh, that was not actually a, a question to me. I, it was a comment, uh, and I think I've already commented on those issues. So, so, so thank you for your comments. Then uh, uh, cyber, Greece. Um, well, uh, NATO has really stepped up when it comes to cyber. Uh, first of all, we have established cyber as a d domain, alongside military domain, alongside um, air, land, and sea, and also now space. Um, that reflects, in a way, the importance we attach to cyber. Um, the second, we have decided that cyber can trigger uh, our collective defense clause, uh, Article 5. And thirdly, we are deeply involved with the industry uh, to work with them uh, to, to strengthen our cyber uh, defenses, but also develop uh, um, what we call uh, national cyber effects, but in reality, uh, offensive cyber. For instance, in the fight against ISIS, NATO allies uh, used offensive cyber to take down um, the, uh, the cyber networks of ISIS, uh, uh, homepages, uh, uh, communications, which ISIS used to recruit, to finance, and to uh, get out their propaganda. So, so, so cyber will be an integral, integral part of any potential conflict in the future, from fighting terrorists, terrorists to pair adversaries uh, in a potential future conflict. Cyber is not a potential part of a conflict in the future, cyber will be a part of any potential uh, conflict in the future. And therefore, we need to work closely with industry. Uh, uh, and that's exactly what we do. Uh, and also make sure that uh, we also, when it comes to cyber, uh, maintain our technological edge. Uh, once again, Attila, thank you so much. It's also a great pleasure to see you. And all the best to you. And thanks to once again for our excellent cooperation. It has been a pleasure to work uh, to working with you, and uh, I wish you all uh, the, your, the best in, in your future endeavors. Uh, many thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for, for your very detailed ans answers. Uh, uh, we are used to it, so thank you again for that and for, for your time. So uh, now we will, uh, we will conclude our, our, uh, this part of the session.